Good morning and good afternoon. My name is David Simon. I'm a partner at Mayor Brown in the cybersecurity and data privacy practice, and I'm pleased to be with you today. We have a wonderful panel discussion today that's going to be focused on uh, legislative action, policy, and challenges over the horizon. Uh, and I wanted to, to begin by welcoming all of you on behalf of Mayor Brown, on behalf of our practice, and also in celebration of National Cyber Awareness Month. Now, today we have with us an, uh, an extraordinary panel uh, of friends and colleagues uh, that I've had the great pleasure of collaborating with over the last few years uh, in connection with some of the work that we've been doing to support the, the US Cyberspace Solarium Commission. So today, um, what I wanna do is first uh, introduce our, our panel and our panelists, then we'll give you a bit of an overview of the topic uh, and go into some of the specific recommendations of the commission and some of the ideas going forward. And this will be a discussion a Q and A format throughout and there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna first introduce uh, Mark Montgomery, who is the executive director of the Cyberspace Solarium Commission and has had a distinguished career at the intersection of national security and cybersecurity. Uh, he, uh, previously served as the lead for policy uh, at the Senate Armed Services Committee and uh, late Senator McCain's dis distinguished policy advisor uh, is someone who knows more than almost anyone I know uh, exactly how uh, a bill becomes a law on the defense side on the Hill and had a distinguished career uh, as a, a Navy Admiral as a two star for many years and as a nuclear engineer by training, if I'm not mistaken. So we're very pleased to have you with us, Mark. Uh, thank you very much. I'd also like to introduce Laura Bate, who is with us. She is a senior director with the US Cyberspace Solarium Commission and a 2021 Next Generation National Security Fellow with the Center for New American Security, and previously was a policy analyst with New America's Cyber Initiative and remains an, an International Security Program Fellow. Uh, very pleased to have you with us, Laura. And then also, Robert Morgus, who, like Laura, is a senior director with US, Space, US Cyberspace Solarium Commission, and at the commission has played a leading role in developing the ecosystem pillars in the commission's final report, uh, as well as the pandemic white paper, it's a supply chain white paper, and the transition book for the Biden administration. And prior to joining the commission, he helped to build the New America Cyber Initiative and held, headed the organization's cyber policy work. And he is currently serving as a member of the Research Advisory Network for the Global Commission on Internet Governance and the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, uh, and has served as an expert for the World Economic Forum. So we have a, a very distinguished panel. Um, and and uh, I've had the pleasure of serving as a pro bono a cyber counsel of the commission uh, and, and have seen all of this unfold. And today, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what the Solarium Commission is and really focus in on how the recommendations have been implemented because there's been an extraordinary amount of action. So for those of you who haven't followed the commission or are less familiar with its foundations, the very high level uh, summary is that in, in 2019, Congress passed a law in the, that was part of the defense bill that created this extraordinary bipartisan uh, congressional commission. It's, it's unusual in that it has members of both parties uh, as commissioners, there are commissioners who were sitting former members of, and actually still sitting uh, former current members of the executive branch and the legislative branch. You have a multiple uh, very uh, distinguished and influential members of Congress as sitting commissioners. And you also have membership in the commission that are in the private sector. For example, this uh, CEO of a, of a major energy company. And so this is a very broad, broad based uh, organization. We're going to hear more from the the, the panelists about that, but the amount of engagement with the private sector, with international partners, with international organizations is extraordinary. And there's a lot of action that's flowed from it. So um, the, on, if you go to solarium.gov, you can see the report. It was published in March of last year, but there's been a lot of action since. And I'll, I'll give you that, that framing and I'm gonna uh, turn in one of our first questions to Laura, but before I do, you know, this is unlike any, any, unlike any other blue ribbon panel or commission, that has just a report with lots of recommendations. I think there's 80 plus recommendations in the report, but if you look look in the timeline from when that report came out in March of 2020 to the next opportunity to legislate, I can tell you that a staggering number of these recommendations became law. For example, like approximately 25 of the recommendations were reflected in law 
uh, in the defense bill from that later that year. Now, before I jump to Laura, I wanna make sure just on administrative note, if you have questions, uh, please do use the chat. So please uh, feel free to ask your questions there uh, and I'll make sure to pick them up uh, either throughout or at the end. So with that, what I wanna do is turn to Laura uh, and, uh, and ask the question for, for those of us who have been tracking this and, and, and for folks who have been a little bit less familiar, give us a sense for how much progress there has been in the last year in implementing the commission's recommendations. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, David. And thanks very much for the opportunity to speak to everyone. Um, you know, progress is good is, is the headline, I think. Um, you mentioned our original report up at solarium.gov. We also have an annual implementation report that we published this summer. Uh, and, you know, for, for anyone who wants to take a look at that, you'll see that more than three quarters of our original 82 recommendations were either done, some version of implemented, or moving right along. So between those and the recommendations you mentioned um, from our additional white papers after that original report we worked on, ICT supply chain, workforce, um, lessons from the pandemic, and we did a deep dive into the National Cyber Director. The recommendations across those, plus the original set, are really moving along nicely. Um, but what I'll do here is I'll walk through a few specifics, some of the key legislative proposals that we pursued. But before I do that, I wanna make three quick overall notes, sort of three caveats on this. First is that things are literally changing daily. Uh, there have been significant developments even in the two months since we published that annual report. So for example, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency created the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative, the, the very snazzily named JCDC. Um, that has big implications for cyber planning office, for integrated cyber planning, um, and generally for joint collaborative environment for things that we have that we've recommended for engagement with the private sector. So progress is always a moving target, but it's moving generally speaking in the right direction. Secondly, I would say that, as we note, sort of throughout the course of our work, progress on implementing recommendations is not the same thing as actually making progress on American cybersecurity, right? There's implemented and then there's implemented right, um, which often means funded, which means supported, which means truly executed. Uh, and so we, we take note sort of as we go through our recommendations that there's more work, there's more activity that'll need to be done even after things get turned into law. Finally, and most importantly, I really wanna emphasize that implementation of these recommendations is absolutely thanks to leaders across government and especially in Congress who have made it a priority to see that these steps are taken to improve American cybersecurity. So as I walk through the specifics on legislation, note that credit is due to them for making it happen. So with all of that said, um, as you mentioned, 25 commission recommendations were implemented in the 2021 National Defense Authorization Act. For those keeping count, that actually amounts to 27 legislative proposals. A couple got split and recombined and shuffled around, but they're in there. Um, some of the highlights include the establishment, nomination, and confirmation of the National Cyber Director. Chris Inglis, uh, one of our former commissioners, was confirmed as the nation's first National Cyber Director earlier this year. And now the United States has a single office for federal cyber posture planning and coordination. So really excited about that one. Uh, we also saw some significant changes strengthening CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, including a proposed 16% increase in their budget in the House Appropriations Bill, as well as a one-time $650 million injection under the American Rescue Plan earlier this year. A um, Couple of other highlights, the NDAA codified sector risk management agencies, uh, Support for the prior system of sector specific agencies really kind of varied sector by sector. And now with that change with, with a legislative mandate as SRMAs, they can begin to provide more uniform, more stable assistance to the providers of critical infrastructure. Um, let's see, other ones we have uh, a process for developing a national continuity of the economy plan, which is really an essential part of boosting national resilience, boosting sort of our ability to respond to and think about um, attacks on the United States uh, or disasters, um, whether they're cyber or otherwise. Uh, finally, last year saw the establishment of a mandate and funding as well for a, joint for a joint cyber planning office, which will really help coordinate cybersecurity planning, readiness across the federal government and between public and private stakeholders. So all of that to say the progress that we've seen is really good, but there's still a lot to do. Thank you very much, Laura. And I want to just thank you for jumping in. For those of you who saw uh, our, our, uh, the invitation, we, we had in, uh, planned to have uh, Distinguished Commissioner Suzanne Spaulding join us 
for this event. And she at the last minute, unfortunately, uh, was under the weather. So she sends her regrets. And we are so thrilled that Laura was able to jump in literally within the last few hours. So thank you for doing that, Laura. Well, I'm a poor substitute for Suzanne, but very happy to join you. Yeah, we're, we're delighted to have you with us. I also just wanted to, to, to underscore that um, one of the, the uh, in critical achievements of the commission, and I'm sure that uh, Mark and Rob and Laura will speak to this further, but with the legislative proposal that was eventually made law uh, to create the national cyber director, um, Chris Inglis now in that role, we are honored that he will be speaking with, with, uh, with my colleague Raj Day, who chairs our practice as part of our Cyber Month activities coming up. So we're delighted he'll be joining us uh, and previously uh, participated with Suzanne uh, on a, a, a last year's uh, National Cyber Awareness Month panel about the Slam Commission. So we're delighted to continue that conversation. So now I wanna turn, now that we've had Laura set up, set the stage for the, the progress that's been made last year and this year, let's focus in on, you know, what does that mean in terms of action that we, we might see? So I'm gonna turn uh, to, uh, to Mark. Uh, and if Mark, you could just let us know uh, for all those watching out there, and we'll see this uh, live or recorded, give us a sense for, uh, you know, what's already in the hopper from a legislative perspective and, and you know, what, what do you anticipate is ready for, for, for a vote, you know, where there's support? Thanks. So um, I'm going to split this up a little bit with, with Rob, but I'll, I'll take the two things that are already, the two bills that are already through one of the chambers. The first is the, uh, and this is a difference from last year. Last year, the commission wrote kind of all, we rolled everything up in the NDAA. And, and that had to do with the fact that we came from the NDAA, that we're required to give reports back to the Armed Services Committee, that the uh, Homeland Security Committee agreed to that kind of uh, relationship. This year, we definitely have been trying to, to get uh, our recommend recommendations or provisions to support our recommendations and a whole lot of bills. In fact, you know, there was a freestanding bill that passed the other day on K through 12 cybersecurity education. That wasn't exactly what we were calling for. It was definitely a lesser, uh, you know, uh, lesser included version of what um, of what Laura and I had uh, had been pushing. But it passed uh, both the House and the Senate, and in, in a kind of a unique thing was signed by the president as a, just a standalone bill. And those are standalone law that is infrequent. So th there's one example. But um, there are two big bills we have with a number of provisions in them. The first is the, um, it's known as the China bill or the CHIPS bill, but it's the United States Innovation and Competition Act. It's uh, passed the Senate, I think with 69 votes or 68 votes. Um, so uh, by, by broad bipartisan support. It's sitting in the house, you know, not for any good reason. It's sitting in the house because it's part of the whole kind of cluster between the progressive and the moderate Democrats over how to proceed with bills. And, and believe me, in the house, only one party is responsible for a traffic jam. Um, in the Senate, two parties can be responsible for a traffic jam, but in the House, the majority controls the flow of traffic, and, and uh, they're been unable to push this through. I think they will. I think they'll either pass this as an independent bill or attach to the NDAA, but the United States Innovation and Competition Act has three big cyber solarium areas in it. The first is it's uh, the Cyber Response and Recovery Plan sits in that bill. Now, ironically, it'll sit in the next bill I'm talking about as well, but this is an important bill to us. We, we called it the Cyber State of Distress. And like all good legislation that we give to a committee, they you know, took the opportunity to change a couple words and, and they removed the word cyber state of distress, inserted the word significant incident, but it's the same. It means the same. It, it allows the Secretary of Homeland Security in consultation with the National Cyber Director to declare this a condition where uh, the um, uh, wh where resources uh, can be made available to respond to a um, to uh, to a a, a, a cyber induced crisis, whether they're actual, it's money, technical assistance, potentially defense support to civil authorities, where U.S. military capabilities are brought in under Title Twenty Two or Thirty Eight, uh, and it also can include standby contracts with private en entities. And this gets to sound a lot like how we use the Defense Production Act and other things to access. Um, uh, critical needs. And, and this, I, I think part of the pandemic, one of the responses to the pandemic has been a greater understanding of what, what's national security right? and what are these non-traditional national security emergencies. And certainly the pandemic was one and cyber, uh, significant cyber effects could be another. It also most importantly sets up a cyber response and recovery fund. 
uh, for which there's already money in it. CISA saw this coming because we'd spoken with them last year, and there's 30 million in this year's budget. There'll be it added more money into that, and the bipartisan infrastructure bill adds even more money. I'm not sure how they'll reconcile all that, but there'll be enough money in there that can be repopulated, so you can provide this. And this could go to municipalities. It could go to private sector entities. Uh, but in any case, it, and it could be used for reimbursement of, of uh, Department of Defense or other federal capabilities. But the, the, um, you know, this is an excellent opportunity to improve our response and recovery. And Rob will talk to a little bit about, about ideas we have on the preventative side in a minute. Uh, the second uh, element in this bill is it's, it's a much smaller one. It's a, a request that uh, CISA begin to put together and publish a national risk management cycle. In other words, we, we're very... We've passed a couple of bill, uh, laws that make it clear that, hey, Department of Energy, you're a sector risk management agency for energy. EPA, you're for water. You know, Homeland Security has a, a few, as we now know, pipeline, you know, TSA has pipelines, things like that. We're telling CISA, hey, you remember, you're also the National Risk Management uh, Authority, and, and you need to have a national risk management cycle, and you have to have underneath that a critical infrastructure resilience strategy. You have to update these frequently. You have to make them available to Congress, and that way Congress can understand, hey, how, what, if I had another dollar to spend, where might I spend it in a prioritized manner uh, to get uh, a more secure national critical infrastructure? So kind of giving, empower, both empowering and requiring CISA to take that centralized leadership role in our overall critical infrastructure risk management, and obviously the national cyber directors uh, in there as well. And then finally in this bill um, are a, a, a few standards improvements. And this is um, Laura and I and uh, Natalie Thompson, who's, got, who's left our commission now, but was a key member, have written a lot about the need for improved U.S. Participations in, participation and support of international standards organizations to make sure that our vision of a transparent rules-based order is predominant and Chinese efforts to kind of push a more sovereignty-based, state-owned enterprise-led, um, um, you know, I don't want to say human rights denying, but certainly, you know, uh, pr private, you know, privacy restricting regime to make sure that that isn't pushed in these organizations. And this requires us to both get have a strategy, get organized as a federal government, work better with the private sector, including the private sector funding to go to some of the ones that are, that are, that are business-based standards organizations, and then work better with our allies and partners. And all of those um, recommendations are reflected in different sections of this USIC Act. So, and as you probably know, the big picture thing in here is $52 billion in microchips and funding for different types of microchip efforts. So. Is a very important bill. We'll, I think it'll pass, but it's been hung up now. I think it was passed in May in the Senate, and I, I imagine it'll get passed in November, December uh, in the House and signed into law. The other one out there is the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Here, uh, the big thing was the Response and Recovery Act is repeated. So obviously, you know, the parliamentarian will strike it out of one of them as the other passes. But then beyond that, uh, there are there's uh, funding for um, state and local government IT uh, cybersecurity efforts, and you know it's over a billion dollars. The one thing that we caution were for this, we said the municipalities, you know, this will help our water infrastructure. This will help some of our rural electrical. It'll help our state and local governments. All things that need to be more secure. But I'll also remind you that a billion dollars on that could easily turn into like a uh, an IT modernization fund and just buying better computers and headsets and and you know, upgrades from Microsoft 7 to or Windows 7 to Windows XP and not be focused on the cybersecurity challenges. There's also money for making the National Cyber Director, and there's, you know, there's funding for the National Cyber Director in there. That's gonna be important because as a new startup in a continuing resolution, he is, ham he is significantly hampered. I say he because it's Chris Inglis now. There's money for a CISA Emergency Response Fund, uh, about $35 million in risk management operations. We supported that and, and recognized as part of our broad belief in strengthening CISA. And there's money for the in the ST directorate, about $157 million in Homeland Security that'll fund a lot of the things that we were pushing for cyber for um, critical technology cybersecurity centers. So some, some very good stuff in there. And I also say in the energy section, there's $250 million for cybersecurity of rural electrical. We would have wished to see the same thing in the water section for whatever reason, not included. And I mean, this is a constant problem in our country that we're, we do not recognize that the weak link in our national critical infrastructure is water and don't provide the sufficient funds for it. So there's, there's a lot of good stuff in the bipartisan infrastructure bill for cybersecurity, overall uh, big support. And that has passed the Senate 
as you know from the papers, it's held up while there's a decision on how to handle reconciliation. I will say that in some of the reconciliation bill I've seen, there's good money for CISA in there. I, that doesn't make me want to support or not support the, the um, you know, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the um, you know, 2.5 or 3.5 trillion dollar plan, but within there is a hundred million dollars I did kind of like. I think a total of about 860 million for CISA that I saw, but a hundred million that I really liked for some specific training uh, efforts. But in broadly, a lot of stuff is going on, and that's before we get to the NDAA. So if you don't mind, I'll throw it over to Rob, and he can talk a little bit about what's going on in the, in the various NDAA uh, versions. Yep. Mark, thank you so much for that. Uh, I mean, so for those of you who are thinking about new cyber laws, we're going to talk about some of the specific standalones, but I think an important uh, point to underscore regarding what Mark just said and then turning to Rob is that these big legislative vehicles that we hear about in the news, the infrastructure bill, innovation bill, the, the defense bill, they are jam-packed with significant cyber laws that have implications. Uh, and we're going to sort of pull those out. So I'm going to turn now to, to Rob Morgus to sort of unpack what we see coming and what's still being formulated uh, in what will ultimately be the N National Defense Authorization Act or the annual defense bill coming up. Thanks, David. And thanks again for hosting us and the work that you've done. I think uh, you know our legislative push wouldn't be the same without the work that, that you've done on a pro bono basis. So, so big thanks to you for that. Um, as both you and Mark alluded to, the NDAA is slightly less baked, I think, at this point than um, some of the bills that Mark Mark talked about, it's through the House um, and their opportunities in the Senate this month, potentially next month or, month, or even potentially into December uh, to, to make amendments and, and, and sort of influence the text of that bill in its final form. Uh, there are a few provisions that we're sort of tracking closely that we think have a decent opportunity to get into the NDAA. Um, one that's already in the NDAA from the House side is the creation of the Cyber Threat Information Collaboration Environment, which is an interpretation somewhat like what Mark was talking about with the cyber state of distress of our joint collaborative environment. So we gave them a joint collaborative environment uh, and they ran with a, a, a new name for it, but the same in essence. And we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, I think a couple of other big ones in there are the potential creation of Bureau of Cyber Statistics uh, and the codification of systemically important critical infrastructure and law. And again, we can unpack those a little bit more, I think uh, a little bit later on, but I do wanna to touch on a few that are sort of a little bit smaller, might not be as noticeable, but I think are nonetheless important that might ride through uh, in the NDAA here. And m most of these you can find actually uh, in a bill that Senator King, Senator Sass and Senator Rounds dropped uh, in August called the Defense of U.S. Infrastructure Act. The idea there is that they're going to take pieces of that bill and potentially drop them into the, the National Defense Authors Authorization Act. Um, starting at the top, uh, I would say, you know, one of the big things that Mark alluded to uh, with the Response and Recovery Fund is this need for pre-boom or sort of uh, uh, pre-incident funding and, and thinking about how we are more sort of proactive on our resilience investment. Um, the commission recommended the creation of a National Cyber Resilience Assistance Fund. Um, in, in our final report, we're working with, with staffers right now on what that might look like. But the general thrust here is that if you think about sort of a, a set of quadrants, you've got sort of support to uh, the federal government and to state and local governments up here, you've got support to the private sector down here, and then you've got pre-boom and post-boom, right? We have support to the federal government and the private sectors financially, or support to the federal government and uh, SLTT governments covered both pre-boom and post-boom. We have funding mechanisms that allow us to invest. Uh, with the creation of the response and recovery fund that Mark alluded to, we will have also that quadrant of sort of post-incident uh, support to the private sector. We will we'll have a sort of check mark in that box. What we're still missing, though, is resilience funding. So pre-boom funding uh, to, to fund or defray costs uh, of sort of uh, resilience investment in the private sector before incidents happen. Um, obviously, you know, many things need to happen to make sure this, this doesn't sort of create a moral hazard, but uh, in some cases, market forces may not drive the, the right level or the right level according to the federal government based on our risk assessment uh, of investment in the private sector. So what we're hoping to see is a report uh, in the NDAA that will cover sort of those aspects and, and take a look at the, the different funding me mechanisms available primarily to the Department of Homeland Security uh, to help sort of defray costs as needed need be on resilience investment in sort of the, the national critical functions. Um, 
couple of other sort of small items, but that are nonetheless influential and important. Uh, the codification of a five-year term for the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Director. Uh, this would help provide some independence to the agency uh, and, and create more gravitas around the position. We think it's, it's an important, obviously, position as sort of the national risk manager uh, for the federal government and as the lead cybersecurity agency for the federal government. Um, in addition, uh, you know, we see the, hopefully we'll see the creation of three critical technology security centers, which Mark alluded to, uh, one that would take a look at sort of testing for telecommunications equipment. Uh, this is basically would uh, work with vendors of telecommunications equipment to conduct vulnerability assessments and testing and work with them on, on remediation techniques. We'd see something similar around industrial control systems and then an open source uh, software security center. Uh, each of these centers would probably be based out of existing institutions, thinking like academic institutions or national labs uh, and, and sort of serve as project managers to help make sure that we have a more robust testing uh, and, and remediation capability. Um, in addition to that, uh, a, a report on the creation of a national cybersecurity certification labeling authority. This would be an entity um, that would basically, again, project manage existing certification and labeling efforts out there. Think about uh, software bill of material efforts or the work that groups like the Underwriters Laboratory do to sort of test products and provide some sort of uh, indication through a seal or, or something like that about the security of a given product. I think, you know, one of the good programs that the government does this through is the, the Energy Star program. We're looking at that as sort of a potential model. Um, in addition, there will be, uh, hopefully, we're working with, with staff to, to pass a uh, provision that would create a uh, strategy to secure foundational internet protocols, specifically looking at the border gateway protocol and the domain name system. Uh, this would task DHS with uh, leading the effort uh, to work with um, basically internet service providers to implement some form of routing security uh, to make sure that we, or to begin to sort of push back against the DNS and BGP hijacking that we see pretty uh, running pretty rampant in the ecosystem right now. Uh, in addition to that, the sort of final, final one that I'd, I'd highlight is uh, the creation of some new authorities for the National Cyber Director to make sure that that entity, the Office of the National Cyber Director, is more well positioned to uh, collaborate collaborate closely with the private sector, including uh, looking at something like a talent exchange program, where the NCD could send uh, private sector individuals out, uh, could send NCD employees out to the private sector, bring in private sector employees just to get that talent exchange going and new exchange of ideas. It also creates a couple of interagency councils that would allow. Um, the, the National Cyber Director to play a more central role in coordinating efforts of the federal government to, to collaborate with the private sector. So those are sort of, those are some of the, the highlights. I think there's also, you know, we expect to see an incident reporting law potentially ride in the NDAA. Uh, I, expect, I expect to see some more workforce provisions uh, to ride in the NDAA. And like I said, the Bureau of Cyber Statistics, systemically important critical infrastructure, uh, and the joint collaborative environment uh, are all things that we're sort of working with and, and keeping close tabs on that might might appear in there as well. Rob, thank you so much for that whirlwind tour. I mean, now what you've heard from Mark, Laura, and Rob is an update on the progress and then a survey of the different legislative vehicles that are in the works uh, where new cyber laws are likely to come from and where there's a tie into Solarium Commission recommendations. Um, and now what we're going to do is drill down a bit. So I think for this audience, which you know is uh, cuts across private sector, legal profession, security leadership, and is global, we want to drill down and look at some of these legislative proposals uh, to understand what they mean. So, for example, if we look at some of the priority recommendations in the Solarium Commission's report, which again is you can find at solarium.gov, um, uh, want to ask about one of the big concepts, and I turn to Mark Montgomery. One of the big concepts in the Solarium Commission report and, in, and now in some legislative pro, uh, proposals is this idea of systemically important critical infrastructure, uh, or for those who know this and are familiar with this debate, they refer to it as SICI. Um, so I want to ask Mark, if you could just explain to us what this concept of systemically important critical infrastructure is, and then you know, what progress has been made uh, for this recommendation? And what does it mean for the private sector if and when this becomes law? Thanks, David. Uh, yeah, this is one of the most important ones we have remaining. I would say it's, you know, one of the top one or two uh, remaining provisions and, and probably 
when it comes to building the appropriate public-private collaboration that was a key element of our commission's findings, this is uh, the critical recommendation. Um, what we're talking about here is the idea that there, there are, look, there's a lot of critical infrastructure out there. I mean, there's, you know, you I mean, you could probably convince yourself eventually that Joe's dry cleaner down the street's critical infrastructure if you need that suit done. But the reality is there are there is some critical infrastructure that's more important than others. And there's a limited amount of bandwidth of government support of kind of pressure of ability to assess. And, and and I'm sure at the same level, there's a there's a limit on what the private sector can afford to do. So it's really important that you understand what are the actual critical functions. What are those things, you know, who uh, who if they're if they were disrupted or compromised, it would have a debilitating effect on national security, economic security, stability, or public health and safety, or some combination thereof, right? So, what are those things? We thought about this before in Executive Order One Three Six Three Six in the Obama administration. They uh, detailed a, a Section Nine. It, it got it ended up being flawed from the get go because there were a, a, lot, a few opt outs allowed. And you know, basically, the cloud service providers weren't in there. Internet service providers weren't in there. Um, the one could be forgiven because it wasn't predominant yet. The other was pretty obvious. Um, the uh, um, and then <clears throat> in the end, there really wasn't a rule set about what to do about it. It didn't help that it wasn't legislatively based. It's hard to give or or help with support if it is. So. We came up with a recognition for systemically important critical infrastructure, and really our private sector lead, our CEO, was one of the big pushers in the saying, look, I can't boil the ocean of my company. I have to know what is important. Look, DOD's quietly been doing this around military bases for years with an infrastructure assurance plan where they go and say, hey, let's just I'll make this one up at Norfolk Naval Station. You need two transformers coming in, 41 60 volt transformers coming in, not one, because we have to know we have power. We can't have a fault. You know, so we can start our, get our big nuclear carriers going and things like that. So, you know, obviously the company wasn't like, well, you know, now that you mentioned it, we want to, we want to give you resilient or redundant capability. We had to make a handshake with them. And, and I'm sure the government paid some money to make sure that they had some, you know, redundant, reliable capability. That was determining some systemically important critical infrastructure for the Department of Defense and taking some action to fix it. Okay. Stepping back into the broader private sector, we have to know what is systemically important critical infrastructure. So in this case, we pass a law, which is going to give it a lot more um, authority and give the government a lot more uh, ability to both support and require effort from the entities determined. And, and there they go through and you, and you determine what are those critical entities where, you know, the disruption or compromise could lead to a problem with national security, economic stability, public health, health and safety. And, you know, to the extent to which that, um, you know, can we, you know, are there, you know, are there areas where they're linked together with other things and could something impede the support of another critical infrastructure? Like that? So you have to go down secondary and tertiary support structures to understand where all your critical functions are. The idea was that uh, working, the sector risk management agencies working with the private sector would try to determine them in their sectors. Then working broadly under CISA and Department of Homeland Security, the National Cyber Director, they would come together with a national uh, listing of these uh, critical critical uh, functions. And look, there's a number of sicky bills out there. All of them say this has to happen. That first part has to happen. We have to know what's critical. And look, if I was in the private sector opposing the bill, I'd want that first part to happen just so I know if it involves me. But <clears throat> the uh, the idea is they come through and over 180 to, to you know <clears throat> six months to a year they make a, a determination of what's critical infrastructure and then most importantly you have to update that every two years. This would not this will this will not be a stagnant list. It can't be a stagnant list, and that's one of the problems with the executive order that exists right now. So now comes the difference. A few you know our original recommendation was in addition to that, you need to come up with a list of benefits and burdens that apply to those. Um, to those infrastructures. Um, there's other versions of the bill called Sicky Light that say, hey, wait a minute, get that list done. While you're doing that list, come back to us to con come back to Congress, DHS, with a list of be potential benefits and burdens so we can work that, talk with the private sector, hold hearings, and then pass a second provision that would that would impose the benefits and burdens on those critical infrastructures. And that would be good for the private sector. A, they'd get two bites at the apple of working on this. They can work with CISA, then work with Congress, but B, um, they can see if they are a critical entity, what is the actual definition of critical entity to understand the implications of it. 
uh, there's other versions of a bill where you don't even discuss that that final part, you know, the benefits and burdens. And so there, there are various versions out there. Senator Kings that is in the uh, that that uh, is we're trying to get through the NDAA cycle now, but that he's put in as part of the uh, Defense of the United States Infrastructure Bill is that one that says step one, step two. But originally the commission rep uh, recommended and we still are comfortable with do step one and step two together. So real quick on what's step two, and that's the idea of what are the benefits and burdens you know, the, the, the benefits are probably, or, or I'd say I start with the burdens. Uh, the burdens are, look, we're going to have to determine what is the appropriate risk-based cybersecurity performance standard that SICI entities um, have to meet. You know, what are those industry best practices, standards, and guidelines? And is there is there a requirement for additional regulations to enhance the SICI? I mean, I think most of us understand there aren't regulations out there in the cloud service providers. So there might have to be some kind of new regulatory regime and on this, but equally importantly, where's the already regulatory regime? I think financial services could come to you with a very competent argument that, hey, we have we meet and exceed any standards that you're gonna have for this. You know, we are trying to get the lowest common denominator. On the other hand, the water industry would not come to you with that. I mean, if you go on the EPA website, it kind of very publicly says, we do not provide you standards uh, as you do your assessments, good luck. Uh, you know, so, I mean, there's a real delta across how the federal government regulates and assists the private sector. And I, I would want to recognize that at the very high end of the financial services, they have multiple regulatory regimes going on in cybersecurity. And I think they meet and exceed anything we could have envisioned in this. A another big requirement would be for cyber incident reporting. But as, as um, uh, Rob alluded to, and I think we'll talk about later in this, that there is incident reporting bill language that's already going to happen this year. That, that, that horse got out of the barn uh, ahead and is going to pass. And then, you know, what other uh, mechanisms are needed, you know, to, to, to uh, you know, to have a more secure, systemically important infrastructure. Now, there, there needs to be benefits, and the benefits are enhanced intelligence support and information sharing. We really do need to pass laws to tell the IC to do this, because I'm afraid the IC routinely says, yeah, we got it, we're going to help. And then, you know, three months later, a GC is like, well, as it turns out, not so much, you know, I'm not sure I can share this information with this company and not that company. And, you know, I think there's a five or six year track record of fits and starts on IC support to information sharing with the critical infrastructure. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It happens. It's just systemically, we need a, a better system. And we need a system that tells the IC, look, you have to prioritize collection against the unique servers and, and, and systems that are in the private sector and not in .mil and .gov, which is not where the IC is normally looking. Um, you know, How can we prioritize federal technical assistance to help these SICI companies? Um, and can we provide liability protection for companies that are SICI that conform to identified security standards that I mentioned earlier? Uh, and, and give them liability against damage or harm directly or indirectly caused by cyber incident. You know, the kind of like the very kind of blunt version of this is, you know, if you're hit, if a Russian government decides to hit you with a cruise missile, we don't hold you accountable for that as a business operation, right? That was effectively, that was an act of war. But somehow, somehow in the cyber world, when a Russian APT or Chinese APT does something to you, you know, we're kind of like, well, you know, you should have done better to defend yourself. You know, you should have had a, that air defense system running, you know, um, which we don't require in the, in the kinetic world, but for some reason in the non-kinetic world, we have this other, you know, we also need to prioritize emergency planning, that kind of federal response recovery act for these companies. That's part of continuity the economy planning, another recommendation we have. And so, you know, my take is, uh, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity here for benefits and burdens that can be worked through. And we'd like, and in, the, in this version, the two-step version, says it could take some time, work with the private sector, uh, work with other federal agencies and, uh, and regular regulators and kind of come to a conclusion on this. To me, if we don't do this this year, this is a must do next year. And if we don't get this done, we're going to suffer the consequences long-term. I, I believe that you know, the, the, um, you know, our, our national critical infrastructure is so integrated at this point that problems in water can take down financial services with the link there being the, the energy production facilities that rely on municipal water that in fact drive you know, power at our financial services companies. There is linkage between, we're all as strong as our weakest link in critical infrastructure. So we need to determine what is that systemically important critical infrastructure. I know that was a long explanation, but I think it's really one of our, our primary uh, efforts that we have to put forward over the next 12 months. Thanks, Mark. And just to, to underline, you know, for, for folks who are less familiar with what the Section 9 requirements are, I think the idea is, you know, a lot of companies are assets to be determined to be critical infrastructure, including tech. 
right? For the tech industry and for cloud where there's almost no regulation, this would be a sea change. Uh, and also it would dramatically change the kind of regulation potentially that could be more prescriptive. So for if you think about how defense contractors are regulated when it comes to cyber, it would be a lot more like that, obviously varying by sector. But this is a significant thing to follow, uh, particularly if you're in a space where there's almost no regulation uh, already. Now, I'm gonna, we're gonna skip over our next question and I'm gonna ask, we'll, we'll link up on information sh sharing and the joint collaborative environment topic when we get to another issue. But I wanna zoom out and go back to Laura and ask a question that, that focuses more on international affairs and diplomacy. So one of the key areas of the rec of recommendations in the Salarium Commission report had to do with the importance of cooperating with allies and partners. And, and for companies, and victims of cyber attack, I think a common theme that may not be front and center when they find out their systems are down because of ransomware is that the threat actors, the ransomware as a service groups that are uh, viciously attacking companies and individual schools, hospitals, and critical infrastructure here and around the world are, are generally operating from cyber safe havens outside the United States. And, and this, particular challenge, the idea of a cyber safe haven has gotten the attention of governments. Uh, and it's something that the Solarium Commission was mindful of early on. And I wanted to ask Laura, if you could just help us understand when it comes to international cooperation, because we can't do it alone, the US government can't do it alone. Uh, with the Biden administration having announced a number of initiatives, um, bringing together 30 countries uh, to address cyber crime and ransomware, and increasing law enforcement co collaboration, we'd love to hear from you regarding how this fits in with the Solarium Commission's recommendation on the Cyber Diplomacy Act and where that stands. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to dive in on that one. And uh, you know, the issue of safe havens is just such such a sticky issue. That and several of the the other issues that really are sort of pernicious and ongoing challenges with how we deal with irresponsible behavior in cyberspace. Um, as as you say, we had a pillar focusing on this in the Commission's original report. Uh, which really sort of zooms out beyond each of those specific in issues individually and looks more generally about how the United States deals with international engagement in cyberspace. And one of the challenges we saw is that in particularly in the State Department, we just really don't have the structures, the prioritization, the hands that we need to deal with these issues. Um, so in order to, do, to deal with that, our recommendation was to establish a Bureau of Cyberspace Policy at State Department which we really feel aligns beautifully with a piece of legislation that predates us. The, the Cyber Diplomacy Act has been reintroduced a few times now, um, but really dramatically strengthens the US ability to advance our international interests on cyberspace policy. Uh, the bill itself has this year passed the House and now sits with the Senate. So, you know, that's an exciting momentum. We look forward to seeing movement beyond that. Um, but it creates a bureau dedicated to cyberspace policy that would ensure that the State Department has both the cross-cutting authority and just the resources needed to participate and beyond participate to lead in the many organizations that shape cyberspace policy. Um, it also expands capacity for the department. One of the challenges we run into is that, that the sort of the U.S. ground game, our ability to really engage country by country, uh, to build partnerships, to identify capacity building needs, to build coalitions, um, and very importantly, to work with other stakeholders outside governments, so to work with industry, to work with um, companies, to work with civil society, all of that takes people. Uh, and having a bureau that can really focus on that is a big part of it. Um, beyond that, the legislation, the Cyber Diplomacy Act, um, calls for a specific international cyberspace policy that really aligns with what we've been using for years. So for folks that follow the space closely, the language will sound familiar. Um, the, the policy promotes an open, interoperable, reliable, unfettered, and secure internet, um, and really focuses on a clear international cyberspace policy and a bureau that's empowered to implement that. Um, Again, for folks that are really watching some of this space, um, and for anyone that reads the, the Washington Post Cyber 202, you'll have seen this morning just a beautiful example of why something like this is needed. Uh, there's a vote coming up in the United Nations over the leadership of the International Telecommunications Union. The two leading candidates are an American with nearly 30 years of experience at the ITU and a candidate who previously worked as the Deputy Telecom Minister for Russia. So obviously we, we've, we've got a stake in this. Um, and there will be a vote and we need to engage with countries across the UN to really work on that. 
Uh, last year, a similar thing happened in the World Intellectual Property Organization. For the last several years, we've struggled with votes on the cybercrime treaty. So you keep seeing this consistent issue come up where we really need to be able to have the people to get out there and engage on some of these multinational issues. Um, outside those big multilateral organizations, there's an enormous amount of work to be done building coalitions of partners and allies to really enforce costs on bad actors in cyberspace and to engage in cyberspace, cybersecurity capacity building. Um, to, to give another example, we recently saw several countries jointly call out bad behavior from China, um, both their own activities and permitting cybercrime activities. Um, and attribution statements like that are really critical because they enable future action. I mean, whether or not the naming and shaming of those particular actors is effective, it's a basis for any kind of enforcement action that follows on. The countries that join in this all say, we know that these are the facts, this is what happened. But building that kind of consensus, building that kind of shared statement takes a lot of people. Um, your example of ransomware cybercrime safe havens, another major example. Um, what we really need in place at State Department are structures that allow these issues to be prioritized and staffed appropriately. And we, we really think the Cyber Diplomacy Act gets us there. Thank you very much, Laura. And I think just thinking about this issue of ransomware, uh, which many of the companies on the line and you see in the headlines, you know, it, it's it's not enough to to have the cyber team, you know, cyber is a team sport, have that team lined up and have a great standard of resilience, because if we don't have the collaboration around the world around this, we will not close those safe havens and this will continue because it's a very profitable business. But I want to now I want to with mindful of time, we're going to ask one sort of uh, basket of questions to Rob that gets to this issue of I think one of the one is going to be the biggest and most likely sea change for companies and government in the United States. Uh, and for a lot of the companies on the line that are, you know, maybe they have a presence in the United States, but they're not based here. Because in the United States right now, when it comes to a cyber incident or a data breach, there's really reporting generally at the state level. So you have 50 US states that have laws that require notification. Uh, but in for most companies, unless you're a healthcare company or you're a, a military contractor, uh, and there's a few other in examples, there's no requirement to notify the US federal government of a, of a data breach. And there's almost no requirement to notify when you have a ransomware attack that doesn't involve data being stolen or accessed. Um, and so the world was taken by storm with the solar wind supply chain incident. Many, many companies were affected, but there was almost no obligation to notify because the law doesn't require it. And so I wanna to turn to Rob to talk a bit about the cyber incident reporting law that was envisioned by Solarium that is moving on the hill. Mark mentioned it's gonna pass in some version. And, and then talk about what that might require, um, how it sort of looks to the extent you can. And then I think married up with this key issue for security leaders, CISOs around the, the, the country and the ones I've spoken to, a key issue is if there's gonna be a massive change in the amount of requirement to disclose information to the US government, it's good to know how they might be used. So talk about the cyber, the Bureau of Cyber Statistics, that concept, and, and how the information might be collected could be really leveraged for the benefit of the private sector um, uh, and the government. Yep. So it's a, it's a fascinating conversation. And I think you sort of hit on one of the key points for me with, with the incident reporting, and that, that is that it's it, it doesn't stop with incident reporting. There are knock-on effects in the way that sort of the federal government does cybersecurity from the Bureau of Cyber Statistics to the JCDC and elements of that, right? Um, and you know what I'd say from the onset is that there's no appetite to do nothing right now on the Hill. Uh, I, I don't think we're gonna see zero movement on this. It's just a matter of what the tenor that movement takes. Um, there are several, <clears throat> excuse me, several propos proposals out there. There's a, a Catco Clark incident reporting bill that's come out of the house. Uh, there's a Warner Rubio version. There's a Peters Portman version that just got marked up at the at his GAC markup. Um, you know, they're relatively similar. Uh, the big outstanding and sort of key elements are uh, covered entities. It's not necessarily everybody, but it is sort of a subset of critical infrastructure that is is incredibly important. Um, you know, what events need to be covered? To your point, David, ransomware. Um, you know. I think we're going to see a version, at least one version that does say, you know, anytime you pay ransomware, you need to pay out a, a ransom for a ransomware incident. You need to inform the federal government. Um, I think, you know, reporting timelines are still being, 
being sussed out, uh, but there's some differences between the versions. Some call for 24, some call for 48, some call for 72 hours after an incident has been identified, right? Uh, I, you know, I think that's an, an interesting conversation to be having. You know, when you suspect an incident's happening, do you tell the federal government right away with the understanding that you may have to fill in details further down the line? Um, you know, I, I think one of the, two of the three bills, I think, I, I think sort of hew to that direction. And then there's a big question about penalties for not reporting. Um, you know, the the solarium suggested in our in our recommendation that there there could be penalties for not reporting, uh, just as a, a sort of negative incentive to ensure that there is compliance. Uh, as the sort of the bills that we've seen so far out there generally don't have penalties baked in, uh, but they do give the Department of Homeland Security administrative subpoena power to subpoena. Uh, a company if they suspect that they are not reporting an incident to get that information from them, you could foresee regulatory action coming off of the back of that in the form of penalties, right? So it's not an immediate penalty directly right there, but there is this sort of threat of potential future penalties. And to your point, point David, I think one of the important questions is, okay, what, you know, if, if the federal government is collecting all this incident information, what are they going to do with it? Um, you know, I think the, the JCDC that Laura alluded to and Mark alluded to at the beginning uh, will certainly be able to make use of this information. You know, the way I think about the JCDC as it moves forward is a piece of it is codified in law. That's the Joint Cyber Planning Office. That's the planning element of the JCDC. It's going to work with the private sector. It's going to work across the federal government. There's also the integrated cyber center component of it. That's the more sort of operational piece of, of, of the work that DHS can do. And then there's the information sharing piece of it. And that's where a joint collaborative environment or a cyber threat information collaborative collaborative environment, whatever you want to call it, begins to come into play. And the information that they collect through this incident reporting law, I think, would help fuel some of that joint collaborative environment. Um, you know, I think they'd also look to potentially plug incident, uh, you know, the feeds that cyber threat intelligence companies collect. I think there could be a high side and a low side where you've got all of the federal government, uh, you know, threat intelligence feeds that are on the sort of civilian or non-intelligence side feeding into a piece of it. And then you've also got that sort of augmented with, with data and feeds from some of our intelligence community. So there's that piece of it. And then there's a Bureau of Cyber Statistics, which would be this sort of long-term statistical analysis about what does and does not work to prevent cyber incidents. In order to know that, we need data on it, right? We need to know when an incident occurred. We need to know what controls were and were not in place. And we need to start doing some longitudinal analysis of, okay, well, threat actor or attack type X uh, with controls A, B, and C uh, it appears that those controls are not preventing this type of attack. Uh, so what else can, what can we look at that might actually do a better job, right? Begin drilling down empirically on what does and does not work in cyberspace and prevention. So like I said, there's a bunch, you know, getting the incident reporting language right is incredibly important. It'll help us identify what's actually being reported by whom, penalties, uh, ransomware, all of that. But then there's so many trickle on and sort of downstream effects of, of a potentially good incident reporting law. Thanks very much, Rob. So now we, we're at a point now we can start taking on a bunch of the questions I see coming through. So thanks for those of you who've sent those over. Um, the, first, the first thing, before I do that, I just wanna underscore an important point that Rob made. So for those of you who are listening and thinking, okay, I, you know, cyber incident, I've never had to report one of those, or it's been pretty rare because data wasn't stolen, you have data loss prevention, whatever you have in place. Um, or maybe you don't have any sensitive data, you're business to business. Uh, what Rob just talked about and, and, the, the, and Laura and Mark have referenced will change that because it doesn't matter what kind of data you have in, in all likelihood. If you have a compromise of your environment, there's an intrusion of a certain kind, uh, you, know, you may well have to provide reports. And you know, I think under most state laws, it's seven days or more, 24 hours, 72 hours. You know, do you have your lawyer on speed dial? So, I mean, I think uh, that's, uh, you know, hopefully th there'll, there'll be some real flexibility in this, but I think that it's important to, to watch that space because that could significantly change uh, your request for a uh, budget uh, next quarter when you go to your uh, board and say, okay, what do I need to, to staff in order to support what burden will be on us? Now, I want to turn to the next question. Or one of the questions we've received is about a recommendation from the Solarium Commission we haven't talked about. And it has to do with the SEC. So if you're a, a, a registered, or if you're a publicly traded company, you know, this is a space you're watching carefully for cyber anyway, because in, a, in something like nine days, the SEC is gonna issue some new guidance about its upcoming cyber rulemaking. 
And the Salarium Commission had been uh, really pushing this earlier on. So I want to uh, open this up and, you know, if, I don't know if Mark, you want to direct who wants to, to comment on this. But so over the past year, we've seen the SEC take an increasingly active role as part of a broader whole of government response to cyber threats. Solar winds was one example. And, you know, many companies received uh, a letter from the SEC this summer, there were three waves of these letters asking, have you been impacted? And if you, and even if you haven't been, tell us about all the other incidents you've had. And this has been a big wake up call for a lot of companies. So the SEC has been playing its part and it's coming up with a proposed rule. Uh, and there's been a lot of recent enforcement actions uh, for companies disclosing not enough or not disclosing at all. And so I wanted just to see Mark uh, to turn to you first to talk about the commission's recommendation for amending a law that many don't associate with cyber, but the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, uh, I think is commonly referred to in, among us as the Sar Sarbanes-Oxley for cyber. What does that mean? What could it mean and, and where is that? Because I think that will have a, uh, an interesting impact. And for even for companies that aren't publicly traded, the standards in Sarbanes-Oxley often affect how even private companies are managed when it comes to security and financial controls. Yeah, thanks. So you're correct. We have felt that um, cybersecurity should be one of the controls inside Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, and we've seen the positive effect Sarbanes-Oxley has had in other areas in management controls, and I think it could equally help in cybersecurity. I, I think, um, look, we wrote legislation as if you were going to modify Sarbanes-Oxley. We also felt it was, you know, executable by the SEC with rulemaking. And so we're excited to see what they come up with. We've certainly given our inputs to the last two SEC commissioners the current and, 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 and past, uh, immediate past commissioners. And we'll see what, um, our chairman, we'll see what happens. I, I'm optimistic. I think things have only got, since we wrote this 17 months ago, recommended it originally. I think things have gotten worse, not better. There is less, there is a greater desire for transparency and uh, an understanding of what the cybersecurity risk is in an investment. And so uh, I think it's likely something's going to happen. And if it isn't done through rulemaking, then we'll come back again and look at a law change. But the easiest way is rulemaking. I think that there was more than enough latitude for the changes to be done using rulemaking, but we'll have to see. Uh, Rob, do you have any other thoughts on that? Yeah, just that this would really do two big things, I think, if, if this were implemented either through rulemaking or law. Um, it would first require companies to disclose track and disclose information security controls. Right. And the second big thing is it would elevate that to the sort of principal financial officer or principal executive officer level, uh, require those individuals to sign off on those controls, sort of elevating the issue of, of enterprise cybersecurity publicly traded companies to a level that I think is commensurate with the, the actual risk that it, it poses. Thank you very much, Rob and Mark. And so mindful that we only have a couple minutes left. One of the questions that I got, you know, because this so the report and the work of the commission has focused on a lot of different areas of risk and sectors. And so I just wanted to, to close up by asking, um, you know, a Mark, Rob, or Laura to comment, you know, in the time that this, the, that remains in the commission's life, which I think is, you know, the end of this year, if there are one or two topics that you're focused on in addition that you want to flag that are, you know, you think they have been blind spots in, this, in the cyber world or is an area where you think there's a need for additional attention. What are those one or two areas? And then after that, we'll close out. I'll go ahead and give that a whack. Um, so Laura has been working a lot on workforce. And so um, I think we continue to do kind of, there's so much going on in workforce that we really need to focus. I, you know, you could talk about the shortfall in America. You could talk about the shortfall of the government. You could talk about the shortfall at NS, at Cybercom or CISA. We're going to look broadly at how do you recruit um, train and retain a better federal cyber workforce. And we're going to give some recommendations to the National Cyber Director on how to do that, and Laura will probably lead that. Uh, then um, something I've been looking at uh, is water and how we can do a better job, um, both uh, broadly as a federal government, specifically with EPA as a sector risk management agency, and then also how the private sector can do better to get to make that more secure. Um, there's both a nation state threat, which is, you know, as I said, some of them are systemically important critical infrastructures. Um, some of the larger municipalities for sure, and some ones that that serve as specific national security or economic uh, security areas. 
Um, and then, um, but, but in addition, there's a public health and safety issue associated with ransomware and a disruption or a worse kind of a manipulation of our water supply chemically. And then um, a third area is healthcare. Uh, and then so Rob uh, will probably lead a, a look at, you know, uh, healthcare is another industry that we worried about in our report, along with water uh, pipelines, a few others that we just felt that the cybersecurity wasn't consistent with the risk from either nation states or criminal actors. So, and we weren't thinking of colonial kind of pipelines. We were thinking much more of the natural gas pipelines that, that service uh, uh, power plants, but Colonial showed you a twist on that. Uh, so that's three areas. Is it, there's a, um, we're also finishing up a disinformation paper, Rob is, and then uh, Laura will set us up with, a, um, with an assessment of how this year has gone, um, similar to the assessment we did of last year and put out this spring, summer. We'll do another thing uh, late, you know, next year, kind of uh, posthumously um, about how things are going. Mark, thank you so much for that look ahead. And I know that we're at time, so I just want to take a moment to, again, reiterate our gratitude to Mark Montgomery, Laura Bate for stepping into uh, last minute. What a great job. And to Rob Morgus, thank you for joining us, for sharing your perspective, for your service uh, as part of the commission, which is an extraordinarily active, uh, small government agency in and of itself. Uh, and thank all, thanks to all of you for joining us for this Mayor Brown National Cyber Awareness Month uh, panel. I hope that you'll join us. We have something like an additional dozen uh, throughout the month, uh, including uh, one of the leaders for, for CISA, the cyber leader, uh, Eric Goldstein will be joining us and a number of others, CISOs, chief privacy officers and general counsel. So thanks for your time and hope you have a good afternoon. Thank you, David. And thanks for your support to us. You do make us an effective organization. You're too kind. Take care everyone.